our interview guest, Brandon Torres de Colette. He is the CEO and founder of Measure. Um, Brandon, thank you so much for being here and for all the, the great work you've done uh, in the industry. You've been in the U, uh, UAS space for a long time. Can you talk to us a little bit about kind of how your career took you into um, the drone industry and kind of some of the, I guess, the vision you had for Measure and, and how you've really grown the company over the last, I guess, six, seven years? Yeah, so you know, it's actually six years uh, this month. Uh, it was May of 2014 where I kind of left my old job and, and officially started Measure. But you know, the idea really came from the experiences I was having within government, primarily on the national security side of the drone industry, focused on you know what drones were doing from an imagery collection standpoint uh, for. You know the military and even some civilian agencies, and the idea was that you know these drones were showing a lot of value, and was there a way to kind of take that value that they were showing for government, DoD, and you know civilian agencies, and translate that into something that enterprises, businesses might be able to use? The problem is, is that you know at the time um, drones really weren't being used at any scale whatsoever for commercial purposes and a lot of a lot of you know businesses were looking at this as, as a new technology like okay i can go out and buy some but what do i do with them and and the idea for measure was can we provide a turnkey service for these enterprise customers bring the knowledge that we have bring the pilots who would fly them and simply provide some sort of actionable intelligence back or actual data back to the customer without them ever having to own a drone, right? So they never had to kind of put their hands on it, get trained, understand how to maintain it. And that's kind of where the idea of drone as a service came out of. Now, as we've seen over the past six years, things have evolved quickly. Technology has gotten a lot better. Um, you know, you the, the, the drones are operating more autonomously, not completely autonomous, but, you know, the ability to lay out waypoints and for the drone to to do that automatically wasn't something that really was available uh, six years ago. And we've also found that enterprises have become more comfortable in adopting drone technology for themselves. So over the past six years, we've really seen a pivot from, okay, do it for me to, okay, I wanna start something internally here, start small and then and then expand that out as I, as I see more value and as I better understand um, you know what the technology uh, can do, um, and so you know we've we've done at Measure you know tens of thousands of, of commercial flights, primarily inspecting infrastructure, whether it's wind turbines or cell phone uh, cell phone towers, um, you name it. But we we've kind of done those type of applications, and what we learned over the past six years is that you know we can distill a lot of our operational experience into a software platform, and that's where really the genesis of ground control came from. Is like we needed our own platform to run large-scale operations, and there wasn't a solution out there uh, mm. that really looked at it from a from a cohesive workflow perspective. Like, DJ had its flight application, and then you had to go and find a photogrammetry or mapping platform, and then you had to go find a separate fleet management you know, software platform. And as we started talking to enterprises, they're like, why do we need three, four, or five different software applications to run a relatively modest drone program? And so we were like, look, we can, we have something we've built for ourselves. We'd love to, you know, sell and talk to you about. So that's where the idea for ground control came from. And obviously, you know, I see and my team sees us going towards a more autonomous future where, you know, software is going to drive a lot of these programs. Um, and you could really begin to scale programs as long as you have a tool that allows you to manage the entire workflow. All right. Let's talk to us more about your um, inspection business and or the, what you were doing over at, at Measure. I know Aerodyne acquired your inspection services business last year. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, kind of the, the types of clients you had in the yeah. inspection business and then talk to us about the acquisition. Yeah, so we were, we were doing primarily, I'd say the vast majority of our customers were large energy uh, clients. So these were asset owners. So, you know, they own thousands of wind turbines or hundreds of solar farms and, and transition, transmission distribution lines. And they were looking for drones to help them manage those assets. So for example, wind turbine, where's the crack? Um, this, this wind turbine's going off of warranty. Can you do an inspection to make sure that nothing's broken? Because if it is, I can go back to the to the uh, the company that sold it to me and get them to fix it. I don't have to fix that that problem. So, 
you know, we we saw a huge, huge amount of traction in the energy space, and it became very, um, very clear to us. And that, and our primary focus really was uh, those energy companies here in the United States and abroad. And so we were really beginning to rack up the wins uh, from you know number of wind. I mean, I think at one point we were doing you know thousands of wind turbines at the end of you know 2019 inspections, and so. We had, you know, pilots in the field. We had equipment, uh, sensors, drones, and doing a lot of collections, collecting a lot of data for these customers, providing really cool, interesting data products back. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was approached uh, by our friends at Aerodyne, and and look, they 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 recently raised a very large round of financing. Uh, they're doing quite well in in Malaysia, and we're looking to expand into North America. And we had already started investing in in software and seeing where a lot of these customers eventually were going to go. And really, the the sale of Aerodyne was about a bet on the future for our software business, was that we think we've got a really great product that works for DSPs, drone service providers, that want to run their own teams in the field, but also for big enterprises like, you know, CoStar or, you know, Evergy or AT&T or CNN or LAPD. I mean, these are all these are all customers on our platform who are running very large drone programs. So I think at last count, we had, you know, five of the largest 10, you know, five of the largest 10 drone programs in, you know, in, in major organizations in the country on our platform. And the reason is, is because they're looking for that, that one solution that could really do it all for them. Hmm. One thing that we've spoken about a couple of times on this podcast is the role of pilots. Hmm. Um, there is belief. So, some people believe that pilots are, you know, more important than ever for the industry. Some people believe that in the next five, ten years, we may see drones flying without the need of pilots. We could see them flying um, essentially on kind of an autopilot or using uh, AI to to actually fly and, and do all the inspections. How have you seen the role of the pilot change in the past five or so years? And what do you think the future is for for pilots? Uh, I will say this. Um Emphatically, pilots are the heart of our of our industry, and if we don't support our pilots, we will not have an industry. And let me and let me tell you why I believe that. If you look at the DAC, okay, everyone talks about the DAC. Everyone clamors to get a seat on the DAC. You know, when that first rolled out under the Obama administration, I put my I put measures hat in the ring and I said, you need to have drone service providers represented on the DAC because we're actually the people out in the field doing the operations. No one else on that DAC initially had any operational experience whatsoever. And I said, we have 200,000 people who've passed the Part 107 uh, uh, remote pilots license exam who are out there every day either as you know single pilots or small businesses trying to make a run at it, trying to do something with drones to, to, to build out uh, the industry to get you know, value out of the technology. And if we can't find a way to make this work for them from a regulatory perspective, to advocate for them uh, when when they need additional professional development or education, um, and make their voices heard on the regulatory uh, and rulemaking bodies that are out there, I think we have a problem. I think if we think that the drone industry is going to survive, uh, you know, just because DJI is out there selling drones, I think I think we're missing. I think we're missing a lot of what um, what is important to seeing this industry thrive. And so you got to keep people excited about this. You, you, if people are going to invest thousands of dollars in technology and, you know, put out their shingle and take the time to take the Part 107 test, let's support them. Let's, mm-hmm. let's make sure they have a means to go out there and make money with their passion. Um, and so uh, pilots get, you know, we we're not. I don't think we're doing enough as an industry to support pilots, whether it's from a training perspective or giving them a voice uh, on these rulemaking bodies. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm I'm surprised at how uh, you're one of the few voices that comes from that perspective. Um, uh, I guess in in the elite vendor pool that you exist in, because um, I'm also looking at you know pure volume of advocates. We don't have as many advocates as other industries, and you know the pilots are really the people who speak up for um, what we're doing. Even internally within organizations, you know, how many of your leads over the years uh, had a pilot w- whispering in their ear that this is, you know, this is something that's actually doable, mm-hmm. you know, because the, the the guy behind the desk smoking the cigar, you know, that caricature, 
Uh, he's, you know, now he's actually probably typing in a laptop on a treadmill, but he's still the type of person who's too busy to actually know what the on the ground details are. And if his organization is successful, it's because there he's got good technological advocates underneath him. Um, so, you know, when we don't support pilots or we tell them they're, they're going to be useless in two years, I don't think we do ourselves a favor or even move us towards an automated future. Um, because five to 10 years from now, uh, even if we're more automated than we are today, I think in terms of like conductors on a train, you know, the guy that's punching your tickets knows every inch of that train's engine because that's required. Uh, and I think whoever's in charge of the automated systems, uh, when we're more automated, they're going to have to be passionate about what that system is. Um, yeah, so we need more pilots and we need more pilot advocacy. And it, I think the current DAC, um, or I, I forget which board it is now, but uh, Intel's on there and I don't even think they have a drone program. Intel's not in the drone business anymore. I mean, look, I, I think that the fact of the matter is, is that pilots in the field will tell you what's possible Right. And get it done. I mean, look, I, I am all for the autonomous future, but let's be honest. Like, if you want to go out and figure out how to get remote ID done or beyond visual line of sight or flights over people, you better be talking to pilots who've done this stuff before or who or who understand how the technology works when it's windy, when it's about to rain, when it's 100 degrees in the middle of Texas nowhere and you're trying to do an inspection of 30 wind turbines before the thunderstorms come. I mean, these are all things that you would think regulatory bodies would want to understand about how how this is actually working at scale. And if you don't understand that, you're just making up right. You're just making it up as you go. And so the the voice of the pilot is in my opinion incredibly important and when we you know and, and the same thing goes for when you're building software you know a lot of companies in in our space that build software and never done an operation how mm -hmm. crazy is that they right. built they built and raised tens of millions of dollars but if you ask them how many actual drone operations have you ever done before you ever put put the code down zero or very so, little. It's like, well, we copy and pasted this section of Esri software. <laughs> right. I mean, you, just, you can't build a software that you're going to want to buy if you don't understand how they're using it or how it should be used. Yeah. yeah. That happens a lot in the in the journalism industry, quite a bit. Um, you just don't have um, comprehensive enough drone programs. No one at those those levels where we see it in is like the exception. Um, they really are, and they always have been. Um, but other, other people, it's, it's kind of interesting because you have those upper echelon people who have never flown a drone, mm -hmm. who have never even studied for the exam, who've never, and then they go and send their pilots out and say, go do this. And you're like, uh, well, uh, you know, you, you, there needs to be a level of understanding and respect for what pilots can and cannot do. It's, 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 uh, um, and, and when they go and do things like that, that just, to me, it just gives me a real insight of, you know, their mindset of just how um, they think the job is not as important as it, as it really is mm -hmm. to every, each and every flight that's, that's, that happens, you know. Yeah, and that, that could lead to adoption problems, too. You know, if, they're, if we're overselling and they're overexpecting. Uh, and the pilot is not there to to tell them this is what's possible, this is what's not possible. Uh, you know, we we get people who get upset, like I thought this was going to change my my business model entirely, mm -hmm. uh, or we were going to get. I've heard two hundred percent ROI. Well, under what circumstances, right? There might be certain circumstances where there are. Uh, I think one of the, the more interesting things Colin Snow brought to my attention uh, three years ago was. Uh, people doing uh, cell tower, not cell tower, uh, power line inspections, they were finding so much damage on the line um, that under normal circumstances wouldn't be considered, uh, you know, damage because nobody had inspected it, that it actually wasn't profitable for them to do the drone inspections in that little area because they decided, you know what, let's just leave the lines as they are and, and keep it at the human level. Yep. And that those are the little stories you wouldn't find unless you're, you know, you, you had a cohort of three pilots who were actually doing that 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 mission work. So yeah. pilots are going to find us the data for what's actually usable um, and which business cases actually work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if we can't regulate the industry with human pilots, how are we going to regulate it? 
without it. Pilot. So, uh, Brandon, tell us a little bit about your time on the FAA uh, Drone Registration Task Force. I know you served on uh, on that force. What, what was your role there? What was the whole task force role? And um, did you see some progress um, while you were there? I felt like the, I mean, that was a while ago, but I, I will tell you that it was, it was a good, you know, it was a good opportunity to start thinking about, you know, how, how you regulate, you know, commercial drones at scale. I, I think what, what happened was that um, we kind of lumped everyone together, you know, hobbyists and commercial operators. And maybe that was the, that was the mistake of the, the drone registration task force is that, you know, there was, plenty of history and, and um, you know, best practices, the hobbyist community, the AMA was already following that we should just said, look, hobbyists continue to do what, what you've been doing, uh, you know, um, and, you know, commercial operators, you're, you're doing an application that's a little bit different here, here, there are going to be separate rules for you. And unfortunately, I think we, we ended up putting those two things together and that may have been a mistake. Uh, I think that that task force was really, um, you know, the beginnings of remote ID, right? The idea behind remote yeah. ID is that you want to be able to identify, you know, a certain class of drones over a certain weight. And we got, again, we got really wrapped up in, well, can a drone of a certain size cause any damage? And if it can, then it has to be regulated. If it can't, it doesn't. And I don't know. I mean, you could you can twist the science any way you want. You know, maybe weight limits isn't the way to go, right? Maybe it's it's application specific, and there's a there's a broader risk matrix associated with how you regulate commercial drones. But again, I do think it's probably a good idea that if you're using a drone for commercial purposes, that it be registered. I don't necessarily think it's necessary if you're a hobbyist. I, I, again, I we 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 made everyone kind of do the same thing, and I, I think looking back at it now, uh, we probably should have said, look, AMA. You know, manage the manage the hobbyists the way you've been doing it, and and commercial is going to have to work on a different set of rules. So, what about the argument that uh, by leaving the hobbyists off the table, you have a huge data gap for for safety purposes? If you want to build, uh, you know, a more automated national airspace system, I, I just think those two things function in such separate areas. I, I just think that when you when you think about hobbyists, I mean, most most hobbyists are operating in single locations at any given time you know, typically under a hundred feet. If you actually asked hobbyists, they're not doing, you know, 400 feet or above or even 400 feet or below. It's really kind of low altitude for fun type of uh, things. And, you know, it's even at, at locations that are, you know, typical RC airfields where this activity is always happening. I, I just, I, I, no one has shown me that like the, the hobby the RC folks in the world are going to have a significant impact on commercial drone operations at scale. I just don't, I just don't see that. I mean, it hasn't happened since the drone registration task force. Um, and so I just don't, don't see that as a huge complication. I'm more concerned about when the systems become more autonomous and when, uh, you know, when commercial customers and government can, can deploy these at scale that we're, we're managing those rather than worrying about, you know, the, the average person who is on, you know, Saturday afternoons flying at an RC park. I'm just, it, to me, that is just not as big a concern, I think. Yeah. You know, I, I would love to say I'm 100% there, but then I also hear the, uh, you know, the DOD security perspective, and that's kind of where the, the idea that we need to know where every drone in the sky came from. Um, I mean, is, I feel like that kind of is, is, a uh, an overcast for a lot of the commercial discussions because it seems like the commercial people are the ones that get left out uh, of of this kind of discussion matrix here. I think you're right on one level that when we brought the the hobbyists in, um, it kind of it muddies the waters for the discussion entirely because mm -hmm. uh, the commercial operator is most likely to be trained, most likely to run a safe operation, be concerned about liabilities. And as long as you tell them what the rules are, they can follow them and will because they have an organizational incentive. Yeah. And if you leave the hobbyists out, then, um, you know, they go along doing their, their thing or whatever. But then the security discussion is like, how do we know when a drone in the sky is a bad actor? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure you can actually know. I think that's one of the bigger, bigger issues. How do you measure intent? I think that's the thing is like, I mean, I get the, again, 
I mean, we're in a, we're in a pandemic and everyone's, everyone is the, the, the thinking is better safe than sorry. But again, you have to assess for risk, right? So, I mean, there are going to be bad actors, whether or not you have a license plate on the car or not, right? So people are going to drive drunk, whether you have a license plate or not. People are going to fly their drone in the wrong place, whether you have a, a remote ID or not. And so I think it's a little bit more complex than simply saying, you know, if everyone was quiet, required to register, it'd be easy to identify bad actors. So, uh, you know, look, I think if anything, um, you know, what we saw happen in the UK with drones shutting down Gatwick and Heathrow, and it turns out, well, maybe there weren't any drones at all. I don't know if having remote ID would have made it any difference because people are going to see and report what they're going to see and report, whether it's mm -hmm. there or not. So if we're really worried about bad actors, it, it um, I don't think a remote ID is going to stop that or registration for that matter. Hmm. Right. Because even if you have 97 percent of the drones in the sky mapped, how do you know that the one flying towards right. the White House is actually flying there for, for malintent or it's just a, you know, a jerk? A dumb uh, right. Yeah. I just don't. And so, yeah, I, again, remote ID is not the panacea. I think everyone everyone wants it to be. <laughs> I mean, I think it's I think it's actually designed for. I, I mean, I think a lot of big companies look at remote ID and UTM as a way to make money, right? As a way to toll folks that are that are using data on their on their bandwidth, at, rather than identifying bad actors. Well, that's the right, you know. If, if you could get it through the legislation, you know, that you you sure. own that, yeah. Or there's new rentable not, uh, bandwidth for companies. Not opposed to making money, but I think I think you have to think about it. Re remote ID not, isn't necessarily about safety and identifying bad. I think also it's kind of weighing um, implementing the perfect end-all, be-all situation, or just implementing something that's better than what we can. Sometimes, sometimes we don't have the luxury to wait for the perfect solution, but we just have to do something now, take a step in the right direction, and learn from it. Um, um, Brandon, we have one more question for you, and we'll let you go. Um, We've seen uh, we've seen a BB loss waiver. We've seen a number of you, uh, new use cases for drones for UAS during the uh, coronavirus pandemic. How have you seen COVID impact the the UAS industry and um, also some of the, your your enterprise clients? Um, how have you seen them be affected? So you know, I thought at the beginning of this back in you know early March that. Um, mm -hmm you know, with these lockdowns that we'd see more of an impact. Um, that being said, you know, people are still buying the software. Um, people are still trying it out. I think as I talk to my colleagues across the industry on the service side, I think they've seen some reduction, but not nearly as drastic as I think people thought it would be right. um, at the beginning of the lockdowns. I am, I am pretty, you know, I don't want to say pessimistic, but very pragmatic and realistic about what the economic impact is going to have on our industry, what the economy is going to have more broadly on our industry. So right. I think a lot of big enterprises and organizations are taking a second, third, fourth look at their budgets. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I hate to say it, but drones are still a nice to have, not a must have. Yeah. And yeah. so when you're looking at cuts, you might look at a drone program and say, okay, we're getting some value and, and, and the folks that run it are, are, are identifying some ROI and, and telling me that if we scale this out and invest more, we'll get more value, more ROI. But, you know, maybe we cut that or put a pause on that for now until the economy gets better. So I, 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 I nobody knows what's going to happen. Um, I, I will say that we have not seen personally a, a, a downtick, a significant downtick, but, you know, I get concerned about the longer term economic impact I also get concerned about, you know, regulation. I, I think too many in our industry have placed a bet on regulation is changing way faster than they're going to on BV loss, on flights over people, remote ID. And I hate to say it, and I, and, but I, I keep saying it over and over, and I've said it for the past six years. If you're not as a business able to kind of make money in today's regulatory environment, you're in trouble because you have no control over what the FAA is going to do as a regulatory body and when they're going to do it. And I think the the rule of thumb is that for every day or week that we are in a lockdown situation, I mean, you might as well push back, you know, regulatory action a month or two 
So, you know, if you if you're betting in your business plan, the remote ID is going to happen in in two years. I would actually push that out to four at this point. I mean, it's just it's a very realistic view of how, you know, how the economy and these lockdowns have had an impact on regulation. So that's where I think you're going to see the biggest impacts from COVID to our industries. And that is in the longer tail of, of regulatory action. Because we've heard some sentiment, people think the the lockdown, um, social distancing, the lack of commercial air travel from normal jets in the sky will actually help the FAA maybe implement some regulations even sooner, or allow them to do some testing that they maybe wouldn't have done normally. But you're, you're not not as uh, bold. Yeah, I'm not convinced. I'm yeah. I'm not. I'm just not convinced. I, I so, hate to say it, good, yeah. but I've worked in government before and. I mean, you know, there there is no you don't get punished for not moving quicker. If anything, it's a freebie, right? To get out of jail free it, card. It, it's kind of, it's, it's down like, the road. right. It's like it's like all the companies now when they say earning when they're reporting earnings, right? Quarterly earnings are like, you know, they can blame anything now on COVID. And it's the same goes for like regulation. The regulations are delayed because of COVID. You know, we're making less money because of COVID. Like, you know. So it's it's you don't yeah. as it, uh, bureaucracies don't get punished for moving too slow, they get punished for moving too fast. And I mean, so this is one of those situations where, I mean, it's the worst possible situation if you're betting on regulatory change. So you know, the, the, I think you you have some good insights on the regulatory side, but on the on the business side, um, you know, there there aren't or. Do you think there's an, an opportunity for businesses to actually make the case for automation? Yeah, I understand the nice to have argument, but mm -hmm. I, I guess for the use cases that have really good ROI, don't they actually have uh, a better opportunity than they yeah. did yesterday? Sure. The one the the one thing that you know um, that strikes me is like if you have um, you know a single pilot in the field who could operate multiple drones at the same time. And and you don't and and instead of one pilot one drone you have you know one pilot and six drones, yeah you're you're creating a huge you know there's a huge efficiencies there and and it's it's way more productive so yeah I think I think that is you know obviously it's something that enterprises have to think about do we want to put more people into the field um, or do we want to put less people into the field particularly in a lockdown situation I think the decision has been let's let's keep more people at home, out of the field. And so if a single pilot can operate multiple drones, I think that's a positive. I don't, you know, I haven't heard that much anecdotal evidence that that's actually happening though. Um, so I think it's kind of like people thinking about it in the abstract, you know, right. I think, oh, well, if everyone's locked at home, drones would be an ideal thing to kind of use to do the things that you'd normally send a person outside to do. And that's true, but I don't see a lot of that happening. Right. I think it's like kind of just more esoteric and more kind of like, oh, academic conversations around wouldn't it be nice if we did X rather than people are doing it and showing value. You know, maybe that's just a factor of us not being uh, embedded in every organization because you would think that just it from, you know, I'm sure car factory or not car factories, but uh, meat packing plants, for example, they're looking at roboticizing uh, elements of that that supply chain that or the um, that uh, that actual you know workflow than they probably were yesterday where you're like this works good enough I'm not going to change I don't want to have to invest in machine architecture that hasn't been proven yet um, but I'm betting a lot of you know uh, companies like that are, are looking at robotics differently I think I do see your point though on on drones it's even drone use explaining it to an enterprises you you have it's more a abstract, right? Mm -hmm. um, how how much aerial data are they collecting in a year now? Uh, and you're telling them they're going to improve that or have more. They they might even ask you where are we going to put that data, <laughs> and what do we do with we, all that data? Do we even need it? We get that all the time. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many enterprises you talk to who who essentially the person in charge of the drone program has a laptop that's completely filled with imagery. Right. That yeah. actually hasn't gone anywhere beyond their laptop. You're like, my mind is blown. Like, I don't know. You know so like, can you get this into a CSV? <laughs> yeah. <It's> like, <laughs> what are you what are you doing? Like they need another laptop because they're they've they've completely filled up the space in a laptop with with images. And so I, you'd be you'd be surprised at what you dig up when you talk to these enterprises about 
what they're doing. That being said, there's, I mean, everyone's along uh, on a different place in that curve of adoption, right? And, and, and it's not uniform whatsoever. I mean, you, you talk to some companies that are way ahead of the curve and have no problem, you know, onboarding new users almost on a daily basis or even on a daily basis. We see them on our platform and then you have others who are really struggling to figure out like, how do we do this? Like how much is it going to cost us? Like, why are we even doing this? And um, there's a lot of that. And there's, there's still, you know, funny enough, six years later, there's still a lot of the ooh-ah factor. I mean, there's still a lot of senior management at Fortune 1000 companies that want a demo just for the sake of having a demo, just for having someone come out there and fly a drone. They can take some video or some pictures. And it's just like, yeah, that's great. That was great six years ago, but we're not doing like demos. So you guys can do some B-roll and, yeah. you know, and put it on a commercial and talk about how you're using Futurism, it. yeah. Yeah, it's like not, not futures. Not, you know, I've heard uh, states actually doing that too. And they're, you know, they're DOTs. Like they're not really launching big enough programs, but it's just to say that they're doing drone work, you know, because it, it looks good for their state. And it is cool. And I get it. It is. I, yeah, I know. That's why we're here, right? <laughs> right. It's cool. I love it. But it's just like, it's really not doing anything for me or my business. I mean, I, I can help you find someone who can do it. But like, unless you want to scale a drone program, I, I don't know. I don't know what I can help you. So any positive words for the pilots to end things off? Yeah. Okay. From you and Carmen. Yeah, to hang in there. I, I, you know, keep hustling. Keep keep trying to make a go out of it. Don't give up. I think that, um, you know, get on every single market and put out a professional website. Uh, keep up on the regulations. Keep pressuring organizations like AUVSI to uh, represent pilots. Um, keep making your voice heard. Attend the DAC. It's public. Get out there uh, and speak loudly uh, about what you think is needed to push our industry forward. Um, and I, I think I, I think we'll get through this. I think the drone industry has an incredibly bright future. It may be moving slower than we all anticipated, but listen, everyone I've met in this industry has a passion for it. Keep at it. And I think we could all support each other. Mm -hmm. Carmen? Carmen, any final thoughts or words of uh, hope for pilots? Oh, it's pretty much I agree with a thousand percent with everything Brandon said <laughs> okay. right. everything that he said you know, he says it um you know for it, it um for pilots I mean I, I agree I think um you know when you attend um even conferences uh, like Interdrone I mean that was the first drone conference I attended and I got just a, a, a really an eye opening experience into what people are doing in, in different linears and how important these different um, these different uh, jobs such as piloting what they do in different different linears so that and you get exposed to so much more in, in every in someone else in a different industry if you can take an application that someone's doing and um, mapping and even apply it to my industry in regards to doing something different you know it, it just opens up the imagination um, of what's possible so you know and, and it's like Brandon said everyone that I know mostly everyone that I know is passionate about it you know a lot of I meet some people who are just like oh this seems fun um, I'll raise my hand let's do it <laughs> mm -hmm. but I think for the most people who I've met in the beginning stages of this stuff like back in 2013 2014 who I network with about drones daily you know you guys it's you know we do have a true passion for it. we want to see um, things change in the right way this is going to make um, particularly what we do here in the states um, possible as possible as much as we can to, to progress the industry so uh, yeah, I mean, keep at it. Yeah. All right, keep at it. And the Interdrone will be here to uh, to support all of our pilots yeah. the way possible. Uh, I want to thank both of you guys for joining us. I know we're coming up on that hour. Um, Carmen, how can people get in touch with you to ask any questions or learn a little bit more about about your work? They can get in touch with me at my website, dronegirlphotography.com, or they can get in touch with me uh, via email. At uh, c period j period means at gmail.com. 
Um, and I'll be happy to, you know, talk to whomever. That's how you can get in touch with me. Great. And Brandon, uh, same question for you. Yeah, you can reach us at uh, measure.com or you can find me on, on LinkedIn. Just uh, type in Brandon uh, too. Yeah. and yeah. send me a message and I'm happy to respond. Me as well. LinkedIn and Facebook page. Okay. So we will put uh, we'll put those links in the description of this podcast. I want to thank everybody for listening. This will be on Spotify, SoundCloud. Um, it will be on the Interjoin website and wherever pods are casted. So thank you guys again for being here, and we will see everybody next week. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank Interjoin. you for having thank me. You. Thanks. Thank you.